I've had a go at nostalgic Nintendo fanboys multiple times on this channel. There's nothing wrong with liking old Nintendo games, of course. The people I have a problem with are those kinds of nostalgic Generation X Nintendo fans who seem to spend all day complaining on the internet about how much better gaming was back in the day. Trying to tear down everything new in a futile attempt to return to their childhood. And again, just to be clear, liking old stuff is fine. Being a dick about it is not fine. But Nintendo fanboys aren't the only ones guilty of such behaviour. Old school PC game fans are just as bad. Quintessential PC genres like mech sims, real time strategy, tactical shooters, arena shooters, among others, all have their fans and by extension, people who complain about the state of modern gaming. In the past I did a video about nostalgic Doom fanboys review bombing the Doom 4 multiplayer better. But beyond that I don't think I've really talked about old school PC game fans. The main reason is that I've never really thought about it. Probably because they are less vocal and smaller in number. But also because they kind of have a point. Whereas old school Nintendo fans have a steady stream of Nintendo sequels and re-releases as well as a bunch of high quality popular indie games like Freedom Planet and Shovel Knight to keep them happy, old school PC gamers don't really have that. For example, when it comes to tactical shooters, what options do you have if you don't want to replay Rainbow Six 3 or SWAT 4 for the millionth time? Well, you've got Take Down Red Sabre and Counter Terrorism Unit, both of which are notoriously horrible games that don't even seem finished. Well, what about mech sims? Well, the closest you'll really get is the Armored Core series. And that's a third person game where you zip around like the Flash on a sugar high. Whereas games like Hawken are more mech themed multiplayer arcade games than proper mech sims. Oh, you also have Steel Battalion 2. Yeah, the last 10 years have not been good to mech sim fans. So while they might have a legitimate case, what they don't have is a reason why. Instead, resorting to the same tired rant that's so formulaic you can write a generic template to fit all of them. Hell, I'll do it right now. Why does no one play games like Blank anymore? I remember back in the day, growing up playing Blank, they were awesome. But people these days, they don't want to have to think. They just want instant gratification, which is why they play games like Call of Duty. Of course, what these rants miss is that these genres died for reasons they either can't or won't see. Be it cheap enemy placement, awkward controls, cheating AI, whatever the reason. Let's look at tactical shooters. They are fun games, but when you look at stuff like Spoonie's SWAT 4 playthrough, the problems become obvious. The later videos demonstrate his frustration with the game. He keeps dying due to one particularly unfair spot and each failure means he has to replay the entire mission and because of how difficult and punishing the game is he has to be careful and precise with each playthrough. Sure, if you've been playing the game for a decade you likely know where to go and what to do but for first time players it's more hassle than it's worth. And that is uh, downstairs there's a moment very early on when you have to clear out the hotel rooms and there are several guys who have decided that they would very much like to hide out in the bathrooms. And that is by far what will wear your team down the absolute most, is those guys who hide out in the bathrooms. Because there's no way to get them out of there. Absolutely none. You think that you could maybe just wing the door open and fire, but if you just rip the door open and fire, it doesn't matter because those guys are exactly aiming at the door at all times. So when you open the door, chances are you're going to get blown away anyway. Second, you still have to yell stop police and then fire because if you don't, you get unnecessary use of violence or unnecessary use of lethal force and you get points taken away. So you have to throw the door open, yell stop police, and then try to react. If they throw their hands up, you just shot a guy who surrendered and you get minus points. If you throw the door open and yell stop police, nine times out of ten, you're gonna get shot. So there's no way to do this. So that's one plan. The second plan is to gas them, but if you throw the gas into the room and then throw the bathroom door open, the gas doesn't go through the bathroom door. 
if you throw the bathroom door open and throw something in, your guys are going to get shot because the guy is literally pointing at the door. There's no way to throw the flashbang or gas grenade and have the guy stop immediately. The gas is probably the safest way, but even so, you're going to lose usually a guy if you don't get shot right away by the guys who hide in the bathroom. There's just no way to stop it. I actually think there may be some way to shoot through the door, but yeah, you're going to lose points that way. And trying to fix the problems is its own can of worms. If you took the tank rushes and micro out of Command and Conquer, would it be Command and Conquer anymore? Would Rainbow Six be Rainbow Six if you couldn't get shot in the back of the head by a sneaky terrorist 25 minutes into a mission? Personally, I'll take a game that's fun over a game that relies on cheap shots and trial and error any day. And if that makes me an idiot, well, then I'll be in the stupid corner having a good time. While you simmer with bitter rage, ranting on the internet about how people aren't playing your broken games from a decade ago. That doesn't mean these genres deserve to die, of course, but as much as you don't want to hear it, it's understandable why these have fallen out of favour with the mainstream. These games are often flawed or frustrating. Few people are interested in such games anymore, not because they're stupid, but because they have better options. A niche audience with specific demands, combined with the rising cost of AAA development, it's understandable why these games aren't being made anymore, and unlike pixel art platformers, indie devs have failed in their attempts to fill the void, and no amount of nostalgia and rage will make the fundamental gameplay problems go away. And none of what I've said in this video is new, from the arguments of the nostalgic fanboys to me pointing at the flaw these games often had, all of this is old hat. So, to end this video, I'm going to read an article from the site Old Man Murray. The article is about the death of adventure games in the late 90s and was written in the year 2000. Thanks for watching and enjoy! A few weeks ago, Game Center ran an article in which they declared that adventure gaming was dead and buried. The Game Center employees who write the titles for articles apparently don't coordinate their efforts with people who write subtitles for articles, because even before the banner graphic was completely over, someone in the subtitle department had upgraded the condition of adventure games to merely vanishing. Still, no matter what part of the logo you choose to look at, adventure games are in trouble. Game Center blames Myst for killing adventure games. Or at least the Game Center employees who write the first paragraph of Game Center articles do. Again, this department may not be in direct contact with the team responsible for Paragraph 4, in which it's clearly stated that Now it seems people want more action than adventure. They would rather run around in short shorts raiding tombs than experience real stories. As far as I can tell, the game sent a Death of Adventure timeline goes something like this. 1. The action-packed mist introduces casual gamers to the pleasures of Tomb Raider. 2. The genius adventure gamers come to the painful realisation that the same equipment they use to explore the complex fantasy world of Leisure Suit Larry can also be utilised by stupid people to run quick. Thanks to their television atrophied attention spans, these casual gamers are mentally incapable of spending six hours trying to randomly guess the absurd dream logic Roberta Williams has applied to the problem of getting the dungeon key out of the bluebird's nest. 3. Horrified by the knowledge that somewhere someone is playing a game that is not an adventure, genius adventure gamers abandon the hobby in droves and resort to their backup source of entertainment various combinations of Babylon 5 novels and masturbating. Game Center mentions Jane Jensen's Gabriel Knight 3 as the last title of note in the genre. I'd like to use Gabriel Knight 3 to illustrate my alternative theory of who killed adventure gaming. Here's the solution to Gabriel Knight 3's first major puzzle in which you must rent a motorcycle. I've pulled it almost entirely from GameSpot and have commented on it only when I could no longer help myself. Since this next part is where I quote directly from the GameSpot game guide, it's pretty dry, so feel free to imagine it being spoken by Old Man Murray's new adventure gaming mascot, Francis the Talking France. Gabriel must disguise himself to fool the moped clerk. You must combine several items to construct an adequate disguise and gain access to the motorbike. First, return to the museum and swipe the red cap from the lost and found box. 
You couldn't do this in the previous time blocks. But Gabriel knows he needs it now and has little trouble stealing the hat from the box. With the red hat in hand, head to the church. Look at the Abbey's house and you'll notice him watering his plants with a spray bottle. Wait for the Abbey to move back into his house and grab the spray bottle. When you emerge on the new street, you'll spot a black cat in the corner. Move Gabriel up to the cat and use the verb menu to examine and pet the cat. The cat dashes into a small opening in an old shed. Examine the hole that the cat entered. Open up your inventory and pick up the piece of masking tape. If you fail to get the tape from Gabriel's hotel room, return there and open the dresser to get the masking tape. Use the masking tape on the shed door hole. Walk back from the shed and you'll notice the cat is now on a ledge. You can attempt to pet or grab the cat but Gabriel can't because the feline is just too high. Here's where the spray bottle comes in. Select your inventory and pick up the spray bottle. Use the spray bottle on the cat and he'll leap down and run again through the small opening in the shed. When he runs through the hole, he left some hair on the piece of masking tape you placed on the hole. Pick up the masking tape and you'll gain the black fur in your inventory. Return to the hotel now and collect any items you missed the first time around that are vital to the disguise. This includes the black marker from the hotel desk, just make sure Jean is wandering around, a piece of candy from the table near the lounge and a packet of syrup from the dining room. Head upstairs and knock on Mosley's door, room 33. He'll let you inside. If you want a hint about what to do with the candy, you can offer Mosley the candy and he'll gladly take and consume it quickly. Also talk to Mosley about his passport, the key to solving the disguise puzzle. If you give Mosley the piece of candy, you must return downstairs and grab another one. Locate the painting over the table depicting the street scene. Use the piece of candy from your inventory and place it on the table. Head down either staircase into the lobby. Look to the left of Jean's front desk and spot the room's buzzer. Examine the buzzers and press the one for room 33, Mosley's room. That will buzz Mosley down at the front desk, but he'll become sidetracked by the yummy piece of candy you left for him. Ascend the stairs on the right side, so you're on the opposite side of Gabriel's room entrance. Follow the camera around to Mosley's room and watch him exit and walk to the table with the piece of candy. Mosley will bend over and grab the candy, gobbling it up like before. Walk Gabriel over just behind Mosley and use the mouse cursor on Mosley or his passport to pickpocket him and swipe the passport. As soon as you have the passport, quickly head to Mosley's room 33 and enter it. Nab his gold coat on the court rack by using the verb menu while the mouse is over the court. Place the coat in your inventory and exit Mosley's room. This sequence could take a few tries to get everything right, but you can repeat the process as many times as necessary to secure the necessary items. The passport and the gold coat. Just use more candy and keep pressing that buzzer. Open your inventory now, make sure you have the black marker and the syrup. Grab the black marker and use it on Mosley's passport to make a moustache. Next, grab the black fur from the cat and use it on the syrup to make a black moustache. Finally, use the red hat on the moustache and then on the gold coat to complete your Mosley disguise. With your disguise ready, return to the moped rental shop. Did you read all of that? If not, good for you. Dumb as your television enjoying ass probably is, you're smarter than the genius adventure gamers who, in a truly inappropriate display of autism level concentration, willingly played the bird-brained events described in that passage. For those of you clever enough to have skipped the walkthrough, permit me to summarise. Gabriel Knight must disguise himself as a man called Morsley in order to fool a French moped rental clerk into renting him the shop's only motorcycle. In order to construct the costume, Gabriel Knight must manufacture a fake moustache, utilising the style of logic adventure game creators share with morons. Knight must do this even though Morsley does not have a moustache. So, in order to begin formulating your strategy, you have to follow Daredevil of Logic Jane Jensen as she pilots Gabriel Knight 3 right over common sense like Evil Knievel jumping Snake River Canyon. Maybe Jane Jensen was too busy reading difficult books by parlographists to catch what stupid Quake players learned by watching the A-Team. The first step to making a costume to fool people into thinking you're a man without a moustache is not to construct a fake moustache. Still, you might think that you could yank some hair out of one of the many places it grows out of your own body and attach it to your lip with the masking tape in your inventory. But obviously, Miss Jensen felt that an insane puzzle deserved a genuinely deranged solution. In order to manufacture the moustache, you must attach the masking tape to a hole at the base of a tool shed, then chase a cat through the hole. In the real world, 
such as the one that stupid people like me and Adrian Carmack used to store our televisions, this would result in a piece of masking tape with a few cat hairs stuck to it, or a cat running around with tape on its back. Apparently, in Jane Jensen's exciting imaginative world of books, masking tape is some kind of powerful neodymium supermagnet for cat hair. Remember how shocked you were at the end of The Sixth Sense when it turned out that Bruce Willis was a robot? Well check this out. At the end of this puzzle, you have to affix the improbable cat hair moustache to your lip with maple syrup. Someone ought to give Jane Jensen a motion picture deal and also someone should cat scan her brain. Who killed Adventure Games? I think it should be pretty clear at this point that Adventure Games committed suicide.